the Eldorado Jane Doe, identified as Kelly. Her last name has been withheld. This is actually one of the first stories I ever covered. And because I spoke far too fast in my older videos, and I don't recommend watching them, I'm going to retell the entire story. The link to the first story, though, will be found below the description. So much more was known about this story than many others. Authorities would eventually discover much of what Kelly offered about herself to others wasn't true. The video I covered her in was Dying Under an Alias. And one of the things that's interesting about the story itself, James McAlpin decided to leave a bunch of negative remarks on the video, portraying himself as the victim and not her, throwing in little insults to me. Other subscribers defended me, which was kind. What was interesting about it is that other subscribers tried to make him tell the victim's name, and this is something he's claimed to know all along, but was withholding, not out of kindness for Kelly's family. He wanted to be paid to tell the information, but now he claims he was withholding it out of kindness. Despite the claims made by James McAlpin, which I pinned to my previous video, it was an easy guilty verdict. Well, it wasn't even a guilty verdict. He admitted to killing her. And despite the story he was trying to tell me, that he's the real victim, it was Kelly. Kelly was his victim. It's not clear how long the two were together, but McAlpin knew Kelly as Mercedes, or at least that was the name he gave her. And their relationship was extremely abusive. Kelly constantly found herself in the ER for injuries that were inflicted by her boyfriend. Her last ER visit was in 1991. It had gotten so bad that her friends and the local police had tried to intervene to get her out of the relationship. But like so many women before her, she kept going back. But she finally did leave him in June of 1991, going to live with her friend Andrea Cooksey. She had even begun to see other people and start to get her feet back under her again. This was something that angered her ex-boyfriend. He offered to pay Kelly the money he owed her if she would just come see him one last time. Her friend begged her not to go, but she told her friend it would be okay, telling her she wanted to get the money to send presents to her kids. But there was no money. She took off by foot for the Whitehall Motel where McAlpin was living. He had a neighbor named Roy Charles Menon, and that man happened to pick that same time to go to room 121 of the Whitehall to retrieve some cassette tapes that he had lent McAlpin. He knocked on the door and Kelly answered. He asked for his property and she replied, well, you'll have to ask him. At that moment, she took the opportunity to leave, rushing out the door. But McAlpin wasn't about to let her walk away. He rushed past her, yelling at her to get back in the room and calling her a name that for this platform I'll just say rhymes with the itch, while continuing to yell to get back into the room. Roy took the opportunity to get away from the argument, and it's worth noting this was a high crime area and it was considered smart to get away if possible for his own safety. It may have saved his life too, as a moment later, a shot rang out. When McAlpin responded to me, he claimed that moments after he called her the name and drug her back to the room by her hair, she stole his gun and shot herself. Although later on, I saw where he also noted that it was her gun, he said, and not his, which conflicts. So while he admitted that the gun was in his hand first, he claims she took it and shot herself but he doesn't refer to the fact that he pulled a gun in the first place. He also claims that although he had the gun in his possession, only her prints were on it, and he had no power residue on himself. However, witnesses saw him flee the scene, and they claim they saw him still holding on to the weapon. He paints himself a victim, claiming she turned it on herself, saying she loved him and missed him. He claims he did 14 years for telling her to do both of them a favor and turn it on herself. He left out how she also strangled herself, at least according to one of the articles. I believe this was the Huffington Post. According to the police, the reason he did time for the second-degree murder was that he chose to take a plea rather than go to trial, and that he admitted his guilt when he took the plea. He also didn't mention to me the fact that he was seen fleeing the scene, weapon in hand. I can't verify or rule out his claims about the gunpowder or the fingerprints but there are volumes of evidence that make it clear he's far from a victim. Angela Cooksey claims she went to room 21 and saw her there. McAlphin claimed to me that she wasn't on the scene at all. Although he was running out of there, I'm not sure how well he was scouting out the area. 
Some reports say her neck was also broken. If this is the case, I'm sure he'd probably claim she did that to herself too. This was all further complicated because when she was found, everyone believed her name was Cheryl Ann Wick. And she had identification saying this was, in fact, her name. But it wasn't. It was just the beginning of the lies. The real Cheryl was located, and she stated that her identity had been stolen when she was working as a dancer in Minneapolis. It's unclear if the woman we now know is named Kelly worked with her. Over the years, Kelly used many aliases, including Kelly Carr, Cheryl Kaufman, and both Sharon and Shannon Wiley. She had been arrested multiple times for charges such as prostitution, public lewdness, and writing bad checks. While we know Kelly was her real first name, it's unlikely her last name was Carr. She had also lived in many different places, including Dallas, Shreveport, and Little Rock. They thought she may have originally been a runaway from Florida, but there's so many conflicting stories, it was hard for them to uncover any grains of truth. In many of these stories, she had either one or two children, including a daughter. She also made claims that she was in the Witness Protection Program when she was a child, saying her father was in the Mafia and admitting she was wanted for robberies on the East Coast. When these stories were investigated by the police, they couldn't confirm any of them. A detective found a copy of a letter that was sent from the police to the FBI, and this stated that her name was Kelly Lee Carr, age 24, and that she was wanted in Virginia and along the east coast of the United States for bank robbery. This was suggested as a truth after one of her arrests. Now, whether or not any of this is true, it's not clear. McAlpin eventually turned himself in to the police maintaining she'd strangled and shot herself, and he was sentenced to 15 years, eventually doing about 12. The police also reported it was lucky that he got what he did. He was a habitual offender with an extensive criminal record. Upon being released from prison, he was arrested more times, apparently for possession, assault, and, surprise, surprise, domestic battery. It appears his days of beating his domestic partner wasn't over. He was approached by the police to help identify her, but he refused to provide her name unless they paid him $4,000. He claimed that her identification would solve other cold cases. He did state that she had a mother and a sister who lived in Florida, and that she had been working the streets since she was 16, and was forced into solicitation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Eventually, it became a way of life and that she was to be sent to Mexico and avoided this fate by starting a relationship with a man named J.J. Davis from Dallas, and later another man named Tyrone. He said she used aliases to avoid embarrassing her family, saying she had two children and she was older than him. When McAlpin was feeling chatty, he also said that she'd been friends with Julianne Mosley, Lisa Renee Wilson, and Mary Rachel Trilicka who were all kidnapped from the Seminary South Shopping Center in Fort Worth on December 23, 1974. He said the four girls grew up in captivity in the area and that Julie, in particular, had died during childbirth. Police have dismissed this claim, and I'm inclined to believe it's as much of a lie as her strangling and shooting herself. The ages don't remotely match up. Kelly was maybe eight in 1974. And while she might have been friends with the nine-year-old girl, who had tagged along with the two older teens, it's unlikely, were 14, 17, and 9 at the time, in 1974. Investigators also learned she told a story about robbing truck drivers with the aid of an African-American male. She claimed she targeted drivers at various highway truck stops, and she said that one of these interactions resulted in the death of a driver. This led to speculation she'd been involved in the murder of Dwayne McCorkendale. He was a truck driver who was found murdered on November 12, 1988. Witnesses recalled seeing a white female and two men, one white and one black, driving a brown Ford Pinto near the scene. However, investigators were unable to establish concrete ties between these two cases. It's possible McAlpin was withholding her identity to protect himself. In 2019, investigators contacted the DNA Doe Project, 
which led to her autosomal DNA being uploaded. A genealogist was able to locate a second cousin, Christina Tilford, who was living in Alabama. While she didn't recognize Kelly, she did say there was a resemblance to her family. The genealogist working the case was also able to identify her father as a descendant of Daniel Wood and Mamie Carter, who lived in Virginia and had nine children between 1916 and 1936. It would take years before more DNA was uploaded and it helped arrive at her identity. It's in part why it's so important to upload to GEDmatch if at all possible. While much of Kelly's story shows an illegal side, that wasn't all there was to her. She was a frequent volunteer with the Salvation Army in El Dorado, and she would share a story of living in homeless shelters in Dallas. While there, she said her daughter was taken by Child Protective Services, and that she was unable to get her back because she was living under a fake name. If you want to see the comments that James McAlphin made to me, they're pinned to the top of my previous video. It appears the reason he stopped responding isn't because he gave up, but rather was again arrested. He came by a little more fame when he lied about the correction officer's treatment of another inmate. He made the evening news. Inmate James McAlphin's claims that Shelton was shot with a rubber bullet and beat in the head with a steel bar were proven false by the extraction video finally provided by the Department of Correction. Checking again for his name, however, shows that he's not on the roster, so it appears he may have been released again. One thing he said to me that might have been true is that there was a desire to protect her family from her choices and the life she was leading. Not on his part, but on hers. It's also possible it had been a choice she'd been forced to make and became a habit after that. He claimed to me that her family knew, seemingly implying that they knew she was the El Dorado Jane Doe, which I don't believe. It's unlikely he had any insight into who they were or what they knew anyway. It is not as if he knew them, though they likely did know she wasn't on the straight and narrow. It's also hard to believe they'd allow her to remain unnamed and yet have her photograph shown so publicly over the internet if the goal was to hide and avoid publicity. That said, once notified, they did withhold her last name, so it's hard to know exactly what is true. Although some families do withhold the entire name, it's not unheard of. It just means they wanted privacy and possibly to protect her memory. Her family did, in fact, release a photo of Kelly prior to her disappearance. So I suspect privacy is a simple reason. One thing that likely is true is that if James McAlvin knew what her real name was, he would have used it as a get-out-of-jail-free card in one of his many arrests as a habitual offender. The El Dorado Jane Doe went unidentified for 30 years. The Wendy Point Jane Doe, identified as Susan Hobbs. Susan was a licensed practical nurse and she'd lived in California since the age of 11. She moved at the age of 41 to Lakewood, Washington in the summer of 1991 with a woman who was described as a possible roommate. She was excited to purchase a trailer in 1992 at the age of 44. It was the first time she'd owned her own home. A male acquaintance would eventually join them in this home. While she was far from where she originated, she made sure to stay in contact with her family. And because owning her first home was such a big deal to Susan, it was really puzzling when she just abandoned it. When the owner of the mobile home park stopped by to pick up June's lot rent, the door to the home was standing wide open. Garbage was strewn everywhere and the drawers were pulled open. It appears Susan and her two roommates had abandoned the home. While Susan's family originated in California, she had an aunt and uncle there in Washington, and they were alarmed they were in contact with Susan all of the time. Susan lived a pretty mellow life, according to them. They wouldn't describe her as being high risk for this kind of thing to happen. So what happened to her? They said they began knocking on doors and asking if anyone had seen her. Whatever they found out was described as disturbing, the details of which have been held back. We do know that her family placed a classified ad as a result, saying her father is critically ill 
and asking for Susan to call them. Sadly, no call ever came. It's known that Susan was 44 when she was last seen, on August 9, 1993, in Lakewood, Washington. It's reported that for some reason she left in a hurry with two others, though if the identity of those two individuals are known, it hasn't been released. She seemingly disappeared into thin air. Her family hired a private investigator, but her location was never found. What they didn't know was on July 7, 1997, hikers found Susan's skull 1,300 miles away in Windy Point, Colorado. A woman called the Forest Service to say that she'd found a skull and mandible at Windy Point. This was found near the Smokehouse Campground, which was located off Forest Road. An in-depth search would be done and enough bones were recovered to lead them to believe the woman stood 5 foot 6 inches tall and it would later be discovered this was accurate, as Susan was in fact 5'6 and 115 pounds in life. Her skull held some clues such as gold crowns and an assessment that she had a condition known as the temporal mandibular syndrome, meaning she experienced facial pain due to how her muscles, bones, and joints worked in conjunction with each other. This is commonly known as TMD. The Windy Point Jane Doe also suffered from scoliosis. They guessed she was likely 35 to 40. They did find some hair and a piece of her belt, leading them to think she was either a brunette or a redhead. They don't know what the cause of death was, and it was ruled undetermined, with a belief that the circumstances meant it was homicide. Scavengers had caused a lot of damage to the bones. There was a recreation done, and the first DNA profile on Susan was done in 2009. Unbeknownst to investigators, Susan Hopps had actually been added to the NamUs database in 1993. In defense of those investigating, Susan's scoliosis wasn't even reported in the listing at all on NEMIS. Even worse, her file was input in 1993, originally, and cleared in April of 1994. So while it was in NEMIS, there's no way they were ever going to find her. It was input and cleared before she was ever found. There are so many factors that leave people hidden and trapped in a place where their identity is unknown. Some were cremated, some were buried but they were buried in a place they weren't supposed to be. They exhumed them multiple times, which is expensive. And the DNA pulled from these individuals in the past often aren't capable of being run through a genealogy database. So they end up re-exhuming, and the cost runs all over again. That was the case for Susan. They had her DNA, but they couldn't run it through the genealogical website. And the cost was about $5,000 for this jurisdiction. In this case, they reported being able to afford it, but in many jurisdictions, that's not the case, and crowdfunding usually happens. The cost is often too much for them. So if you're interested in helping with a case like this, there are various ways that you can donate. You can go to the DNA Doe Project and pick what case you would like to fund. Or you can use Amazon Smile every time you buy from Amazon and pick the DNA Doe Project like I did. You have to be sure, though, when you order, that you're actually on the Smile website. That's Amazon's out. Regular Amazon purchases are not part of Amazon Smile. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll help. As for the original DNA uploaded for Susan, CODIS had no matches. In this case, it was not until eventually loading her DNA into the commercial database that it matched her brother and sister, who were already in GEDmatch. It's often not this easy. As I mentioned earlier, a private investigator had been looking for her, and it was this investigator who was alerted when her sibling's DNA finally got a hit. The investigator was behind uploading to GEDmatch, which was a smart move. Private investigator Amy Johnson originally believed the Colorado number that called her to be spam, and then she heard the message. She had been looking for more than 20 years for Susan and the message alerted her that the identity of the Montrose County's Windy Point Jane Doe was in fact Susan, and it was that Jed Madge entry that helped identify her. For that P.I., Susan always mattered. She had been doing a favor for the family as a newly minted P.I., as she had been in a relationship with one of Amy's relatives. She was never paid for this case, and she recently spoke to the press saying that bringing justice to Susan was always her goal. 
The fact that she's been found is the best outcome based on circumstances, she said. I've never forgotten about her. Even 20 years later, her picture hangs in a place where I see her. I've always thought, where are you? She had been following possible leads all these years, since 2003. Sadly, in this case, she still isn't going home, because homicide is still suspected as the cause of death, and the case is active. Therefore, they cannot release her bones. Hopefully, however, it gives her siblings some sort of peace to know what happened to their sister. Amy said it was all for Susan. She was an amazing person. She got tangled up with the wrong people. Nobody wants their family member on the side of a hill. This woman was a kind and gentle soul. She didn't deserve it. Susan's case is still under investigation. Susan went unidentified for nearly 28 years. The Upper County John Doe, also known as Kittitas County John Doe, identified as Donald Grant Anderson. Donald Anderson was from Minnesota, but he had moved to Bellevue, Washington shortly before he went missing in 1977, although he wouldn't officially be declared missing until 20 years later. It is important to note that this doesn't mean his family didn't care or even try to report him, but that for the longest time, police insisted adults had a right to go missing and they refused to take missing person reports in most of these cases. And as a result, this contributed to a lot of John and Jane Doe's. It's hard to link a Jane Doe to a missing person case when there's no missing person to match them to. But then again, there also wasn't national databases or anything linking the jurisdictions together. So it's impossible to know exactly how much of an impact it had. It's so much easier now with everybody going into a central database. At the time, they were limited to the organization of the jurisdiction inputting them. It's not clear how old Donald was when he went missing. He's listed at 35 to 40. What his family didn't know was that he was discovered a year later, in May of 1978, in Kittitas County. Donald was living in Bellevue, which is in Sonomish County, so he wasn't all that far from home but it would not be until March 15th of 2022 that his family would finally have an answer and know Donald's fate. This is the extent of what's been released. It appears the match was made when a sibling was located via forensic genealogy. Donald Anderson went unidentified for 43 years. The West Memphis, Arkansas Jane Doe 1990, identified as Zena Marie Jones. Zena was 30 when she disappeared, leaving a lost and confused five-year-old daughter behind. She would be discovered on the shore of the Mississippi River on July 28, 1990. They were able to tell in life she'd been about five foot two, and she was very underweight, about 85 pounds. But who she was remained a mystery long after the man who took her life confessed. It would come out later her life was taken by a monster who took the lives of as many as 95 women from 1970 to 2005, a monster by the name of Samuel Little. He largely targeted women of color, but that wasn't always the case. He chose from the most at-risk population he could find, working girls and those with addictions or both. He felt himself clever that he wouldn't or couldn't be caught because of who he targeted, but he wasn't clever and he was, in fact, caught. He was known for drawing the women later on that he targeted from memory. And what was shocking is these pictures were pretty accurate. He didn't do it out of the goodness of his heart, though. In fact, he refused to even help investigators if they ever mentioned that they were trying to give the family closure. It's not something he wanted or cared about. It was more about bragging and reliving it. The picture he drew of Zena was more accurate than the reconstruction done by the police. He told the police that she wanted to make money, and he wanted to take a life. And he bragged that while he was strangling her, a Memphis police car drove by, and they had no idea. He eventually placed her in his truck, traveling a distance and tossing her away as if she didn't matter. He described her clothing, and it indeed matched what she was wearing when she was found. In her pockets was a crack pipe, two packs of condoms, and 64 bullets. Her remains were sent to the crime lab and a sample was submitted to the University of Northern Texas, 
for human identification. Eventually, Bing logged into CODIS. Sadly, it would take 31 years before DNA confirmed what Bernice Talley guessed when she saw a newscast that sent chills through her. Bernice was just five when her mother left home and never returned. Over the years, she heard a lot of stories that were disturbing, but saying her aunt Vicki Waddington refused to believe them. The two of them, in part, wanted to believe that Zena was still out there somewhere and they could find her. This is a common thread in so many identifications. They held out hope for her return until 2019, when the family was watching a News Channel 3 broadcast, and a sketch done by Little appeared on their TV, with a note saying she was killed in Memphis. And as I said, it's a very accurate depiction of Zena. She was immediately recognized. Bernice knew this was her mother, and she contacted the Memphis police. Little would die in 2020 but police were able to question him one last time. He said he met her on Crump Boulevard between 1985 to 1990, providing again accurate details of what she wore. Her sister would later state that they actually lived around Crump and Mason Boulevard at the time, and they had lived there for many years. He drove her across the bridge to Arkansas to dump her. Detectives working with the Crittenden County Sheriff's Office were able to tie Little to an unidentified body pulled from the river in 1990. WREG covered the scene back then and reported she was found by a fisherman. She had been on the shore for a couple of weeks, and she was wearing the clothing Little described. They took a mouth swab from Zena's daughter, Bernice, but it would take more than a year before they were able to tell her it was a 98% match. She had finally found her mother. That's one of the biggest takeaways from these cases, too. No matter what mistakes these men or women make in life, no one deserves to be without a name, and they all have parents, siblings, children that love them. Everybody deserves a chance to go home again. Whatever mistakes they made, they paid for far more than they deserved. The despicable human known as Samuel Little helped use his drawings to close more than 50 cases, though he did it for himself, not the family. He enjoyed the power it gave him, and he would refer to the drawings as his babies. There are likely more unsolved cases attributed to him. Well over 20 drawings of women haven't been matched yet. Zena Marie Jones was 30 when Little took her life. She went unidentified for 31 years. Had she lived, she'd be 61 today. The Bolton Jane Doe, identified as Juanita Diane Roxy Coleman. Most people tend to think of John and Jane Doe's in terms of older cases spanning decades. But the truth is, there are on average 4,500 Doe's every year. Most are identified within months or days, but every year 1,000 of them are still unidentified as the year mark is passed, even in this day and age, with NamUs and DNA. Juanita Coleman was known to be missing. She had a missing person poster that was circulated online, and she was in several missing persons databases, which isn't always the case. Sometimes even with all the pieces available, however, matches aren't made, which is the case for Juanita. She went missing in 2016, and it was two years later, in 2018, that employees from a tree-cutting service discovered her skull in a wooded area along Champion Hill Road in Bolton, Mississippi. Someone appeared to have burned some of them, and due to the circumstances, the cause of death couldn't be narrowed down. They did the best they could, saying they believed investigators were looking for a missing African-American woman, likely under the age of 30, but that was the extent of what was logged into NamUs. They couldn't find all of her remains, so height wasn't even an option, which very much limited the search, and no match was made. Although it's unfortunate a match didn't happen, they weren't giving up. In 2021, the Mississippi State Medical Examiner's Office teamed with Authorin Labs to get a DNA profile. It wasn't easy, and it took special techniques due to the degraded nature of the sample. The process is expensive, and the cost for these tests was funded by a Mississippi native named Carla Davis, who deserves thanks for donating over $100,000 to fund cases like this. Othram then used genetic genealogy to establish a connection, eventually identifying her as Juanita. 
Juanita Coleman went unidentified for four years. She was missing for six. She was just 19 when she disappeared. If she'd have been allowed to live the life she deserved, she'd be 25 today. The White House, Kentucky, John Doe, identified as Ricky Boyd. Ricky Boyd's skull was found in a driveway near White House, Kentucky in 2020. And although he was skeletal, he hadn't gone missing long before in May of 2020 from South Point, Ohio, which is located about an hour and a half away. He had a wife and kids who had no idea what happened to him. His wife spoke out about how hard it had been for the kids especially, and how thankful they were that they had finally found what happened. He gave the best hugs, his daughter said. He had a great smile, and he could fix anything. Anyone with information, please call the number on the screen. Ricky Boyd went unidentified for two years. The Mitchell County Jane Doe, identified as Angela Bradbury. Angela was 29 and last seen in Mason City, Iowa, on April 6, 2021. She seemingly disappeared, that is, until a woman was found near the Greenbelt Trail in rural Mitchell County in July of 2021. They've yet to release the cause of death. If you have any information on this matter, please call the number on your screen. Angela Bradbury went unidentified for nine months. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. If you could help to get the channel noticed by the YouTube algorithm by liking and leaving a comment, even if you can just leave a thumbs up or some emoji, it counts as engagement. It would be so appreciated. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. Thanks everyone. Take care of yourselves and each other.